Alrighty, good morning. Good morning. I'm Donovan Richards, Chair of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. And this morning we are joined by Council Members Gentili, Faka, Chen, and Mendez. Uh, I would like to also welcome back Lieutenant Commander James Lloyd. Back. He's back. Welcome him back. Everybody clap. You just came from serving our country. Where were you? Okay. Well, welcome back. Uh, today we have 10 items on our calendar. We are going to start with public hearings on three cafe applications, land use items number 709, 710, and 711, and the Special West Chelsea District Tax Amendment, land use item number 729. Once we have completed these four public hearings, we will hold a vote on these applications in the downtown Far Rockaway development, development plan, uh, the Ebenezer Plaza, the 34th Street Heliport, and the 462 Broadway applications. After our vote, we will move on to public hearings for the rest of the items on the calendar. The 50 Nevin Street application, land use items number 730 and 731, and the 40 Wooster Street application, set, well, land use item number 732. First, I will open the public hearing for land use item number 709, an unenclosed sidewalk cafe application for the Handcraft Kitchen and Cocktails Restaurant located at 367 Third Avenue on Manhattan in Councilmember Mendez District. I know she was here. She's uh, here. She's here. Oh, okay, you moved. Okay. Uh, we'll call up uh, the applicant, Patty Sullivan, representing CRC Hospitality Group, LLC, and I'll go to Councilmember Mendez for comments if she so wishes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, this, when it was originally filed, uh, was filed to have seven tables and 14 chairs. After meeting with the owners and going on the site, um, uh, they agreed that that would be too many tables and chairs on a busy street and have agreed to um, downsize the amount of tables and chairs to five tables, 10 chairs, and four of the tables will also be made smaller, 18 by 24 instead of 24 by 24. Um, the plans also adequately f reflect now that there is a bus stop there without a shelter right in front of this location. Um, I think uh, the changes we made will uh, help the business as well as help uh, the surrounding community uh, to have uh, less obstruction when walking and allow the business to have their sidewalk cafe. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the applicant. Thank you. Do you want to say anything on the record? Um, if you could just hit your mic and just say, uh, 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 say your name and who you're representing. and then you Sure. Can, uh, My name is Patricia Sullivan. I'm representing CRC Hospitality Group, LLC, and we agreed to Councilmember Mendez's suggestion, so we're happy to do all of that, so thank you for working with us on that. Thank you so much for your testimony. All righty, are there any other members of the public here who wish to testify on this issue? All righty, seeing none, uh, we will now close the public hearing on land use item number 709. I will now open the public hearing for land use item number 710, an unenclosed sidewalk cafe application for the Made in Puerto Rico Latin Cuisine and Sports Bar located at 3363 East Tremont Avenue in the Bronx in Council Member Vaca's district. Uh, I will call the applicant, yes, oh, actually, oh, actually not the applicant, but uh, Matthew Cruz, who's representing Community Board 10, and I'll go to Council Member Vaca for comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. When a business owner hopes to add a sidewalk cafe to their property, they must go through several steps to get approval. This process is not merely a formality, but takes place to ensure the sidewalk cafe will not pose any danger or disrupt the community. In my tenure at the City Council, I have never had to call up a sidewalk cafe. Yet, today, there is an applicant seeking to construct a sidewalk cafe that I worry would impact the community. Made in Puerto Rico, located at 3363 East Tremont Avenue, has had several issues over the past year or so, and I do not feel that they should be granted approval. Community Board 10, whose District Manager Matthew Cruz will testify, shares this concern and has already voted against the sidewalk ca cafe application. 
Made in Puerto Rico has not had a good history in the community and has failed to prove that they will operate in a responsible manner. The business had their liquor license revoked by the New York State Liquor Authority for serving alcohol to minors as recently as this past spring. On August 16, 2016, the SLA also noted the business failed to comply with noise regulations and violated pre-mixing rules, that the business had a history of being a disorderly premise, using unauthorized DJs and security, and non-compliance with local regulations. In addition, there have been at least two instances over the past five months when there were complaints filed about loud music coming from the restaurant. The Department of Consumer Affairs has also received complaints that the restaurant is violating the law by adding 20% to uh, tips to bills. To bills, It is true that there is a new owner for the business, but this individual was associated with the restaurant and in a position of responsibility when these problems occurred. Accordingly, I do not agree with the claim that the new ownership should allay community fears. The new owners must prove in their actions that the business is a responsible community partner. As of now, I fear that if a sidewalk cafe is granted at this location, the issues they have will multiply, and this will pose a threat to the quality of life for people in this community. And it is for this reason that I ask that this application be denied and ask my colleagues to vote in the negative. Okay, we're joined by Councilmember Richie Torres from the Bronx as well, and we'll go to the community board for... Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chairperson Richards and members of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. My name is Matthew Cruz, and I'm the District Manager of Bronx Community Board 10. I'm here before you today to voice my community's, uh, my community's concerns and opposition to Made in Puerto Rico, or MIPR Incorporated. Made in Puerto Rico is a food and drinking establishment in my district, located at 3363 East Tremont Avenue, Bronx, New York, 10461. Made in Puerto Rico is seeking to operate an unenclosed sidewalk cafe under application number 2017-5396-TCX. Since 2015, the New York State Liquor Authority, or SLA, cited Made in Puerto Rico for operating a disorderly premises, for failure to conform with its licensing application on several occasions, for failure to comply with noise ordinances, and for failure to supervise its staff on two separate occasions, which the SLA states is given to establishments only when it observes its, poor, its prior infractions that have gone unaddressed. In addition, the SLA cited Made in Puerto Rico for a sale to a minor on April 6, 2017, which resulted in the SLA canceling the establishment's license and an order to the owner to surrender her license. To date, Made in Puerto Rico has paid nearly $20,000 in civil penalties and has been a subject of discussion at Bronx Community Board 10 for several years. On May 22, 2017, the SLA disapproved the transfer of the application from a previous owner to the new owner, who I believe is with us today, due to the pending charges aforementioned. Simply put, the extension of this establishment onto the sidewalk will do much to harm the quality of life our residents enjoy. Made in Puerto Rico has only shown that it cannot supervise its staff, cannot conform to its liquor license application, and cannot adhere to the city of New York's noise regulations, and is liable to sell to alcohol to minors. To be sure, the approval of this unenclosed sidewalk cafe to an establishment that has been cited by the SLA for failure to post warning signage, such as the ill effects of pregnancy uh, while drinking alcohol, runs contrary to the City of New York's Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's educational campaigns. Lastly, Bronx CB10 voted to deny Made in Puerto Rico's license application on November 19, 2015, when it was just when it was brought to us. The board voted to deny the application for an unenclosed sidewalk cafe on May 26, 2017. In addition, on June 27th, I wrote a letter to the SLA clarifying that the board objects to Made in Puerto Rico's method of operation and referred to our denial on the application on November 19, 2015. Please find in this testimony a history of Made in Puerto Rico's New York State Liquor Authority infractions that were requested via the Freedom of Information Law on July 6, 2017. In addition, please find all the correspondences written by my office to the City of New York and the State of New York since 2015. Thank you for your attention to this matter. Thank you so much for your testimony. Councilman Mubaka, you have any questions? You're fine. Have, um, let me ask you, have you heard from neighbors or um, businesses or civic association leaders concerning this application? Uh, several. Several constituents and the Waterbury LaSalle Community Association. 
and what has been their position? Uh, their position is they're in opposition to this sidewalk cafe. Uh, there were many instances of noise, uh, fights at this, at this uh, location for, for many years, since 2015. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. All right, we will now go to the owner, Fabrico, I believe. Alonzo? Okay, please come forward. Mr. Fabrico, you're going to state your name for the record and who you're representing, and then uh, if, you wanna, if you have testimony, you may begin, or otherwise we can hop right into questions. Um, my name is Fabrizio Alonso. I'm the new owner of Made in Puerto Rico. Um, I just want to say I understand everybody's concern, uh, the community board, and um, uh, everything that has been addressed to me. Uh, as a new owner, I am trying to make it better. Um, I'm willing to work along with the community to make it better. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to change the restaurant. The previous owner, you know, I, um, I was associated with, with them, but, um, you know, I was just an employee at that time. Now I'm an owner, so now I can make change myself. And when did you become the new owner? Um, shortly after me. Shortly after May. And so you were aware? Well, we were in the transitions of negotiating and dealing, so I officially became the owner um, towards the end of May. And Once the liquor license was surrendered from her. Oh, so is this just one of the, uh, uh, what would we call, you're, you're shifting the chairs around a little bit since one person. N no, no, she completely has nothing to do with it. You sure? 100% positive. What would you say to some of the allegations that w the community board just said? You to be honest, and, and, I, and more I, importantly, how are you rectifying those issues? To be honest, I wasn't aware until I applied for the sidewalk cafe. I wasn't aware that these things were going around the community around. Wait a minute. So you the worked there. How long did you work there? About a year. A year, and you were unaware of the issues that I wasn't aware that all these complaints okay. were going on. When we submitted and said we were going to renew the liquor license, community board ten approved. Once we applied for the sidewalk cafe, they they came up all these issues i had i wasn't i wasn't aware no one from the community board reached out to me said listen we're getting these complaints um what, what's going on no one they just when i went to the community board i was just bombarded with all these complaints i, I wasn't i was 100 percent unaware okay i'm going to go to councilman bavaca but i just want to say you're coming to ask for more and you haven't rectified the current issues, so it's going to be very hard for this community. Well, I haven't been given the chance to. Um, the, right. the liquor license is rendered. Um, I'm closing early now. I, I have no, uh, I'm not serving alcohol. The restaurant is still operating, mm -hmm. so all we're doing is just food. So in okay. reality, I haven't had the opportunity to show that I could improve it. Do you think you should show before we give more? I would like to get the opportunity, yes, to show that I can. Okay. All right, I'm going to go to Councilman Babaco. You said that no one came to you, but you just also said that you started ownership in toward the end of May. So if there were complaints, they would have gone to the previous owner. That's number one. And number two, isn't it true that you were the uh, manager of the bar during the sale to liquor issues that arose? You were the bar manager. Am I correct? Yes. Uh, Council Member Torres. To your knowledge, what are the issues, quality of life concerns about your restaurant? Um, the issues is uh, people having it and doing um, indecent acts in their personal car, uh, the sidewalk, um, the street on the side, uh, people are, are littering, leaving empty bottles. And, um, you know, it's just people just stay hanging out. Loud, loud noise around the corner. Loud noise, littering, right. indecency. Right. And you said you were unaware of these. I was issues? unaware because I'm, I'm basically concentrating on what's happening in front of my location. I don't have eyes around on, on, or in the back of the building. And so, when were these concerns brought to your attention, or when did you become aware of them? Um, the last time I went to the full community board meeting about the sidewalk cafe. Okay, but before then, you had not reached out to I the have, community. I, I had no idea, okay. at all. Thank you. All right, and I'll just recommend this because I have the same issues in my district. 
um, along one of my busiest corridors is perhaps sitting down with the council member and perhaps local community members and stakeholders. Um, and I think that, you know, this committee is going to look for you to do those things before we move forward on, on this application. Um, all righty. I will now close. Any other questions from my colleagues? No? All righty. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who wish to testify on this issue? All right. Seeing none, I will now close the public hearing on land use item number 710. We will now move on to land use item number 711, an unenclosed, un unenclosed sidewalk cafe application for While We Were Young restaurant located at 183 West 10th Street in Manhattan in Council, Members District, Council Member Johnson's district. I now open the public hearing on this application. Uh, the two applicants are P Patty Sullivan while we were young and Bradford Dunnigan while we were young as well. You may approach. Oh, she's back again? Same applicant? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Got it. Okay. Oh, okay. Got it. Okay. Got it. okay. okay. All right. Welcome back, Welcome back Patty. <laughs> Thank you. You're busy today. Yeah. <laughs> All righty. Okay, so my name is Patricia Sullivan. I'm representing while and, we're young. Uh, is your mic on? I think so, yeah. Okay. Um, and then I'm here with Bradford Dunnigan, who's the owner of the establishment. It's at 183 West 10th Street in the, in the village. Um, Bradford had agreed to reduce his tables and chairs to a total of three tables with six chairs. And he also agreed to close the cafe at 10 p.m., seven days per week. We met with um, Council Member Johnson's office um, to discuss some of these things. We also presented them with the 800 plus signatures that he received in support of his liquor license, plus an additional 60 signatures in support of this cafe, along with about five um, letters of support for the cafe. Um, so, so essentially, we're just we're asking for the three tables and six chairs so that he may begin operating the cafe. All righty, thank you. You want to say anything, sir? Nope. All righty. Thank you for your testimony today. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who wish to testify on this cafe? All right, seeing none, we will now close the public hearing on land use item number 711. Our next hearing will be on land use item number 729, the Special West Chelsea text, dish, text Amendment. This application would modify the zoning text to facilitate the construction of an operations facility for the High Line and a staff-only access stairway at property located at 131 10th Avenue in Councilmember Johnson's district. All righty, we will now call Sal Salman, Salman Khan and uh, can't make out his name. Michael Bradley. Ma oh, Michael. Okay. Your handwriting is like mine. All right. Michael Bradley from uh, NYC Parks and Recreation, and we're joined by Chair Greenfield. Good morning uh, to, Chair John, um, to Chair Richards and to the committee. My name is Salman Khan. I'm here with uh, Friends of the High Line, and I'm here with Michael Bradley from New York City Parks. We're here to present on the uh, West Chelsea D, E, and G uh, text amendment. So the site that we, uh, the application is related to a site located between 18th and 19th Streets, just west of 10th Avenue. Um, the, apologies. Uh, the application is uh, to modify a portion of the zoning text to allow uh, what would be a stair and elevator to uh, become a much needed maintenance and operations facility for NYC Parks and Friends of the High Line. <coughs> uh, in the current zoning, uh, this site is a uh, bonus site that is required, uh, is permitted to purchase additional floor area, uh, and as part of that, they're required to provide a stair and elevator to the park, to the High Line Park. Uh, what we're hoping to do is, uh, because we have a number of access points already, including uh, one just to the north, as well as an elevator that will be constructed one block to the south uh, at 18th Street within about a year and a half, uh, we are hoping to use this opportunity to modify this requirement to, uh, to be used as a much needed maintenance and operations facility. Currently, the only uh, op ma permanent operation space that we have is at the southern end of the park, uh, which means that we have staff walking from excuse me, from 34th Street uh, all the way down to uh, access any kind of restroom, storage area, or maintenance facility. Um, 
Uh, and as I mentioned, we have uh, a number of access points throughout the park, uh, including elevators uh, at about half of our, our locations. Uh, we've worked closely with both uh, Council Member Corey Johnson as well as the Community Board and Manhattan Bar President and have received their support for this application. Um, this is a, a couple of photos of the existing conditions of the site. Uh, the two top photos show the area where the, um, the easement would be constructed. Uh, the, the bottom two show some of the issues we have with uh, the crowding on the High Line. We've received uh, a significantly higher number of visitors than we expected throughout the years, and this facility would allow us to alleviate a lot of these uh, operations issues that we have as a result of the, the high usage of the High Line. Uh, these are a couple of the site photos. Uh, the development is being constructed by the related companies. Um, they are also uh, on board with this application and are very supportive. Um, construction would begin early next year and the easement would be constructed by the related companies and would be provided probably towards the uh, middle of 2019. Uh, this is a plan of the site. Um, we would use it for uh, custodial staff, horticulture, uh, rest area, as well as to support our uh, low cost and free public programs. Um, uh, and it would be the only space that we have, as I mentioned, uh, north of the southern end of the park. So this is very strategically located at the center of the, the, the High Line, which is a, a mile and a half long. So uh, creates some, some difficulties for operations. So this would be a tremendous opportunity for us. Um, and that's it. Uh, Michael Bradley with Parks, if, if you have any. Uh, I'm Michael Bradley, program, uh, project administrator and former uh, Highline administrator for New York City Parks. Uh, Parks is co-applicant. We strongly support this application. Um, our partners, Friends of the Highline, are invaluable in maintaining the Highline at no cost to the public. Um, and uh, we have seen firsthand the difficulties that they have in the operational uh, uh, maneuvering of, of staff and equipment uh, north and south along the High Line just because of the enormous crowding on the High Line. Um, and if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you so much for your testimony. Just go back through, um, so obviously you're getting a bonus, and how much investment uh, is related putting in? Uh, the number is, um, I have it here actually. Uh, related provided uh, five point eight million dollars uh, and received one hundred and sixteen thousand additional square feet for their property. And that bonus area is going into housing, correct? Correct. Okay. And how much units is that again? Is related here or no? Uh, I don't believe that they are okay. here. I don't know the number of units, but I, I can find out and send it okay. to you. Okay. Alrighty. Uh, alrighty. I'm good. Any questions from my colleagues? Alrighty. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other members of the public wish to testify on this issue? All righty, seeing none, I will now close the public hearing on land use item number 729. Okay, hopping around here. All right, we're going to go to Wooster Street now. Our next hearing will be uh, for land use item number 732, the 40 Wooster Street application. Okay, great. Frank, you'll just state your name for the record and who you're representing, and then you may begin. And we're also joined by Council Member Barron before you begin. Sorry. Uh, hit your mic, and you'll uh, have to start again. Frank Angelino, on behalf of 40 Worcester Restoration LLC, the owner of 40 Worcester Street, Manhattan. Uh, that's on the west side of Worcester Street between uh, Grand and Broom Street in the southern portion of Soho. Um, um, we've distributed uh, plans and I, um, if you will look at the, uh, there's two sets of plans. One is the uh, city planning plans, which are printed in black and white. The other are in color. 
if you could go to the color plan first, which is the landmark plan, um, and go to page A2, you see a um, drawing of, or a rendering of the building itself. This is in the set of colored landmark plans by Least Easton Architect. And, um, Um, on, on the screen, you will see the building. This is a 74711 uh, special permit application, which requires two actions, one by the Landmark Commission and the other by the City Planning Commission on the zoning aspect of the application. The proposal is a change of use, uh, zoning change of use only, no bulk waivers, 440 Worcester Street. Uh, the building was constructed in about 120 years ago uh, by relatively anonymous architects, but it is one of those very handsome anonymous buildings which add a great deal of character to the uh, historic district that it's located in in Chelsea and uh, in Soho. Um, the Landmark Commission in 2015 voted to approve the preservation plan for the building, which includes the entire basically remaking the entire exterior of the building. Um, and it has all sorts of different elements from uh, steel uh, metal cornices to terracotta, uh, handsome terracotta works over the windows. It has uh, uh, brick of a distinguished uh, character. And the restoration plan is to restore it completely to the original storefronts, which are not there now, but will be restored and all of the windows will be new wooden windows as opposed to present aluminum windows. Uh, the terracotta will be restored, all three sides of the building. Uh, the fourth side uh, has a party wall with the building to the north, will be restored completely. Uh, the Landmark Commission issued a report saying that um, the owner has agreed to an ongoing maintenance plan for the building and the report went to the City Planning Commission asking their action on the uh, land use application. The land use application would be to convert a building which has been used basically for office use and some arts related use, but non-residential use over the last uh, 120 years to ground floor retail use about 1800 square feet and the four units of residential use on the upper floors of the six story building. The, um, the application went to the uh, community board, which said that um, they would approve it on condition that the owner agreed that there be no eating and drinking establishments in the ground floor retail use, and that uh, he works uh, with uh, to give uh, space to an arts related use, no matter what the retail use is in the ground floor, to use the space together with the retail use on a regular basis. Uh, this, the organization Indie Space, which is a not-for-profit uh, group, which is focused on um, uh, having uh, re rehearsal space for uh, uh, you know, theater groups, has submitted a letter to the City Planning Commission saying that they're working together with the owner to have this uh, use incorporated in the retail space. And, um, the um, owner has offered Indie Space the use of the space for one month if this application is approved so that they can see how the space works and what type of a use that they would, uh, what works best, you know, whether it's a cluster of days or whether it's a periodic, uh, some other periodic uh, basis. Um, the uh, application then went to the borough president's office which asked that the owner work with both the Department of Cultural Affairs and Economic Development in order to get, if possible, an arts-related use, uh, which the owner is interested in getting uh, for the ground floor retail use. Uh, then it went to the City Planning Commission, which handled the zoning aspects of the application. And the Planning Commission found 
that the application met the requirements of 74711, the two requirements in that it, w it had minimal impact on uh, the community, which is a mixed-use district with uh, two residential buildings re nearby and retail use on a number of the floors of the buildings on the immediate block and in the neighborhood. And uh, the City Planning Commission uh, found that uh, its uh, change of use will have minimal impact on the Soho neighborhood. So that in a thumbnail sketch has been our experience over the last two and a half years of going through the EULA process. And now we are before you for the final step and we respectfully request uh, your consent to allowing this application uh, to be approved. Yeah, I'll go to Margaret Chen uh, for comments and questions. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> I know that the, um, the community board and the borough president had made some recommendation, so I do support that to make sure that there is opportunity um, to have some creative space available because, I mean, the applicant didn't say it, but the residential unit on top, it's going to be luxury, I mean, it's going to be market rate housing, right? That's correct. Yeah, so it's not adding to any kind of affordable housing. And the threshold, um, I guess, from the applicant is under the uh, MIH, Correct. right? So then we have no opportunity to create affordable housing. Um, but I think that you are renovating, you know, you are renovating the building to maintain the historic character, that's, that's important to the neighborhood. And I think it's really important that we find the opportunity for creative and, and usage uh, in the retail space. And I know that the chair also um, asked about MWBE and local hiring. So as many community benefit that we can bring, um, as much as possible, will make this um, project something that I would support, you know, be due to the lack of affordable housing being created once again. Thank you. The, the applicant supports uh, the initiatives that have come as we've gone through the process. And uh, we're going to re request, uh, rightfully request a letter from you on the MWBE piece and local hiring piece as well. So before uh, we vote this item out, uh, in the committee, we're going to want to hear a little bit more and see that letter actually come uh, to our desk, to both Councilmember Chen's and my desk, to ensure that you know local hiring is a part of this process and MWB procurement as well. So you are getting luxury units, but we do recognize partially the trade-off of ensuring that the community has benefits, and we understand that you're under the 11 unit threshold and square footage threshold to trigger MIH. Um, so we're sensitive to that, but want to hear more of how those community benefits are going to continue to translate to the local community. So thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you very much. Do you have anything you wanted to add? No? <laughs> Just a smile today. Okay, that's all right. That's more okay. important than my testimony. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right, are there any other members of the public who wish to testify on this issue? All righty, seeing none, we will now close the public hearing on land use item number 732. And we are going to lay over this item for future consideration uh, as all of the other applications. Oh, no, actually, we don't have to say that yet. We're skipping around. Okay. We will now go the, to 50 Nevin Street, uh, land use items number 730 and 731, located in Councilmember Steve Levin's district. And I will call Giovanni from Goldman Harris, LLC, Joseph Bieber, I believe, and John Wolfling. Uh, do you have any handouts or anything, or uh, a gift? Yeah. Okay, all right, you're getting them. Too. Okay.
Once your mic is lit up, you may begin. Sure. Good morning. Uh, my name is Giovanni Gioia. I'm a planning and development specialist with Goldman Harris. Let's bring your mic, mic a little closer to you. Oh, Thank sorry. you. Uh, we represent um, Institute for Community Living, um, ICL. Um, they are the owner and operator for uh, 50 Nevins, which is also the subject site for our ULERP application located in downtown Brooklyn, which is also in the special downtown Brooklyn uh, district. Our, zone, our ULIP application is twofold. It's for a uh, zoning map amendment for a portion of the site to rezone, upzone from a C6-1 to a C6-4. And in concert with the rezoning is also for a zoning te uh, text amendment for an MIH mapping for which the applicant is requesting to map uh, the MIH option one and option two onto the site. And if I can go to the next slide. So our site, uh, 50 Nevins, is located on a, it's a corner lot. It is located on Nevins Street between Shermerhorn Street and State Street in downtown Brooklyn. And it is uh, also, again, it is in the downtown special district, uh, downtown um, Brooklyn special district. And it is also within the um, Shermerhorn uh, limited height district, area B, in which the height is capped at 140 feet. Um, also, it is served by mass transit. Um, here's just a couple of views about some uh, uh, adjacent built context. Uh, Shermerhorn Street is a very highly dense commercial corridor uh, with developments rising about uh, anywhere between 14 to 25 stories. And then here's some of the existing building, uh, 50 Nevins, which was actually built in 1913, originally the uh, YMCA is at seven stories with a small two-story penthouse. And then here's just a couple of other context shots. And so from the land use map, um, you can see that we have um, Shermerhorn Street, again, a very high, dense commercial corridor, and State Street, more uh, residential townhouse, uh, five and six stories. Our zoning application is to upzone the northern portion of our site. Our zoning lot is uh, bifurcated with an R6B, which is 32% of the zoning lot, and a C61, which is 68% of the zoning lot. The upzoning is to increase uh, the development potential for a programmatic need, which uh, Joe Bieber from ICL will describe the mission of ICL and the programmatic need for that. And um, in, in order to do this, the existing building right now is a 4.28 FAR at 150 SRO units for existing residents. And uh, the proposed development will result in a 7.43 community facility building with 128 units. Thanks, Giovanni. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Joseph Bieber. I work with ICL on real estate development. And um, Institute for Community Living is a 30-year-old nonprofit organization which provides mental health services and supportive housing in all five boroughs of New York. Uh, currently, ICL operates about 2,400 units of supportive housing, about half of those scattered site and the other half congregate. And this building uh, at 50 Nevins, as, as Giovanni mentioned, is a former YWCA. Um, ICL has been operating the building since uh, 1986. Uh, for 150 mentally ill single adults. Uh, the building was acquired by ICL in 1995. Um, the development proposal is to substantially rehabilitate the existing building and build new additional housing on the adjacent parking lot, which ICL also owns. And John Wolfling will, will describe that project. Um, the plan would result in 128 self-contained apartments. I mentioned that currently all the units are SRO rooms of about 120 square feet each. Um, there'll be a mix of studios, twos, and three bedroom apartments. And this will, unlike the current project, which is transitional housing, uh, funded through the State Office of Mental Health, the new project will be permanent affordable housing and supportive housing. 60% of the units will be supportive housing the other 40% affordable. So there will be 77 units of supportive housing and 50 units of affordable housing with an additional on-site uh, uh, superintendent. There will also be on-site social services to provide services to disabled um, individuals and families, as well as 24-7 front desk security. Uh, 
The development will enable ICL to importantly modernize what's really an obsolete SRO building. Uh, it currently has the same layout as the original YWCA. It will also create additional supportive and affordable housing, again, all in self-contained apartments. And, and it will enable ICL to comply with the Federal Olmstead Act, which requires that disabled persons be fully integrated into the community. So whereas it's now exclusively mentally ill, single adults, the new project will be 60% disabled. Uh, it will also include, um, as I said, 40% affordable. There will be a mix of singles and families, and it will accomplish that, um, uh, the goal of the Olmstead Act. Um, so uh, with that, let me just introduce John Wolfling from Dadner Architects uh, 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 to describe the uh, project. Good morning. My name is John Wolfling from Datner Architects. The, uh, the project, um, as has been described very sufficiently by, uh, by Giovanni and Joe, uh, is in downtown Brooklyn. Uh, it bridges a, uh, a zoning district. The expansion that we're going to be doing is in a uh, parking lot area, which is the area in green that you see on the screen. Uh, so we are expanding horizontally and also vertically. Um, the, uh, the two uh, expansions are going to be integrated in that the building will act as one building. There'll be one core, uh, one entrance to the building for the residents. So it really is a very efficient way of uh, development uh, and expansion of this building. We are expanding vertically, uh, and as Giovanni had mentioned, we are not going, we're still under the 140 foot limited height district, and that is because the existing building only has a certain amount of capacity to expand vertically. So we are limited by the physical constraints of the existing building, um, and because of that, we are actually not even utilizing all of the, uh, the available floor area as well. Uh, as you can see, the building is a, a very handsome building. This is the existing building. Our uh, design approach, which you saw in the initial uh, rendering, which I'll go back to at the end of this, is um, intended to be very respectful of the existing uh, fabric of the building. We're going to be retaining that, uh, that large cornice at the top of the building, uh, expanding vertically above that and bringing the two masses together um, and, and having them kind of held back with a reveal. So it's, a, I think, a sensitive uh, intervention to the existing building uh, and really respectful of the existing um, uh, historic nature of the building. So you can see here the, the massing, the yellow is the existing building, the green is the proposed. Uh, the uh, architectural treatments are indicated a little bit more uh, formally in the, if I go back to the initial rendering, uh, you can see how we're wrapping these two masses together. Uh, we, don't, we didn't want to replicate the existing building. Uh, we wanted to be uh, honest and, and bold about what this, uh, this is expansion is going to be. Um, so different color of brick, uh, different fenestration treatments, but the, um, the, uh, the windows will be, uh, allow you know, a tremendous amount of daylight to get into the apartments. Uh, we're going to be doing uh, some, su su some sustainable measures for the project. We're going to be using a heating and cooling system, um, a mini split system, VRF. It's a very efficient system, uh, not only for uh, operational issues, but the existing building doesn't really lend itself to punching new holes into the envelope. So uh, we're, we are doing that as for a variety of reasons. We may do extensive planting of roofs or maybe a high albedo roof. Um, to reduce the energy consumption on the building. So there's a variety of things that we're doing that are, you know, good practice uh, as far as sustainable design goes. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Can you just go through, so you're going from FAR, what was the prior FAR? So you're going to a 7.44? So uh, actually the existing building right now, the... Okay. Um, actual built is a 4.28 and that's okay. a result because the adjusted floor area max the r6b grants you a four yep. and then the c6-1 actually is a six and then so after the rezoning um the proposed is a 7.43 and i believe the adjusted floor uh, area max permitted is uh, just underneath an eight because the c6-4 is an r10 which is bonusable yep. up to an r uh sorry far 12. Alrighty, and I know these were 150 SRO units that currently house there, right? So are we losing, so everyone who's, are people actually in the location now? So people actually reside in the location? That's right. right. Correct. And, and right, and they'll be relocated uh, okay. to other ICL 
uh, community residences. Uh, community residences mm -hmm. operated by other nonprofits. Mm -hmm. uh, treatment apartment programs funded through the Office of Mental Health specifically for this purpose. Uh, and, and those who wish to return uh, who are appropriate and clinically appropriate for the new housing and would like to return will be given priority. And how will you ensure that that actually happens? Well, I mean, ICL will continue to, to, to work so with So you're residents. the conduit. That's right. Okay. Um, and can you go through community facility space as well? Sure. I mean, there... And what sort of programming is... There will be a roughly 3,800 square foot retail space, if that's what you're referring to, that fronts on Skirmerhorn. And the Brooklyn Borough President has asked us to consider uh, a cultural use for okay. that space, okay. mm -hmm. uh, which ICL is, 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 is very receptive to and has agreed to work with the Borough President, with City Council, and any other sort of relevant key stakeholders to try to identify mm -hmm. a cultural use that would complement the, the BAM cultural district. Um, we have not committed to that because it also has to be economic and because this project is really a good year and a half off from even starting construction. We're in the early stages of financial structuring. And, um, but we're committed to a process okay. and, and even to working with a potential cultural use to raise funds to supplement rent if that's required. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then for uh, residents, what does community facility look like? The, the residential so will there be apartments? community rooms or right? Okay, so right, right. there'll be on site. And what sort of services come with that? Right, there'll be on and have site. Have and sorry, and lastly, sure. have there been complaints about this facility or from the local community at all? Have we heard any complaints? Uh, there haven't been any recent complaints. There were some issues several years ago that were mediated actually by Council Member Levin's office okay. uh, and the State Street Block Association, and we've. Uh, presented to uh, the Borham Hill Association, which has included special outreach to the State Street Block Association, and haven't had any um, concerns, any current concerns. Okay. Um, as far as the on-site um, services, uh, there will be case management services, mental health services, assistance in job training and placement, okay. um, sort of comparable, similar to other supportive housing projects I'm sure you've, you've reviewed here. Um, those will be those will be on site. Um, they'll also be an on site, as I mentioned, uh, uh, super. There's a current community space which we're considering uh, using for a shared space that the community could use in terms of um, potentially art gallery uh, or other. There's a ground there's a ground floor Sorry. plan uh, on the last page of the handout that illustrates the. Uh, the proposed ground floor that indicates that community space. And that will be largely restored in its current configuration. Okay. All right. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from members of the subcommittee? No? All right, seeing none, we will now close the hearing. Oh, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on this issue? All right, seeing none, we will now close the public hearing on land use item number 730 and 731. Thank you. Thank you. All righty, now on to the fun part. We're now going to hold a vote to approve two of the three sidewalk cafes and the special, special West Chelsea text amendment, which will have the support of the local council members, and to disapprove Made in Puerto Rico side cafe, which, as you just heard, does not have the support of Council Member Vaca due to the establishment's history of disorderly behavior, noise, and liquor license violations. We will also vote to approve with modifications the following applications for which hearings were held at prior meetings, except for land use item number 717, which we will vote to disapprove. All righty, so we're going to do... All righty, so we're going to start with downtown Far Rockaway. And we'll be voting on a series of modifications to the downtown Far Rockaway Development Plan, which is located in my district. Today we begin a new chapter in the history books for the Far Rockaway community, a community that for decades has felt the remnants of Robert Moses' era planning that created both an economic and social tsunami that this community still hasn't recovered from today.
To make matters work, the, last, the lack of city investment for nearly 40 years created cynicism in government and a life of hopelessness for young men and women I grew up with whose limited options to educational programming and jobs created a conduit straight into the prison industrial complex. When I set out on this journey 15 years ago as a naive city council intern looking to change the world, I was disheartened to see children as young as four years old learning something called bullet drills. Yes, you heard it right. It was so dangerous at that time that children learned to duck into their cubbies when the sounds of gunfire erupted, and on a few occasions those bullets pierced their daycare glass. However, let's be clear for a minute that those bullets pierced a hole in our children's innocence as well. This is why today's agreement to rezone downtown Far Rockaway is much bigger than just about the words density, bulk, and height. This rezoning engages and rectifies the compounding issues that have plagued this community for decades. Today we begin the journey of building on the progress we have made over the past four years by infusing hundreds of millions of dollars into infrastructure, quality jobs, parks, streetscape, transit improvements, and both community facility and open space. These investments will ensure that the Far Rockaway community enjoys the amenities that so many other communities in the city have. Today I'm happy to say it's a new day in Far Rockaway. I'll start uh, with some of the uh, modifications we're going to be uh, proving, um, which, apply, which require for this plan to include a zoning text amendment, zoning map amendment, designation of the downtown Far Rockaway urban renewal area, approval of the downtown Far Rockaway urban renewal plan, and two approvals for dispositions of city-owned property both inside and outside the urban renewal area. We will be voting to modify the zoning text amendment in order to add the deep affordability option to the MIH area designation. We also require more in extensive signage, hours of operation, and litter receptacles in the designated open areas. We will also restrict the proposed authorization to allow waivers of bulk regulations so that only rules governing yards and distance between buildings can be waived and restrict the waiver to buildings containing only income restricted dwelling units. We will also make a series of changes to clarify the zoning bulk regulations to ensure that the zoning reflects the understanding of the community. We will also be voting to modify the disposition approval to exclude the site on the northwest corner of Augustina and Namioak Avenues block in lot numbers 15534, lot 70, in order to ensure that this area is developed as a park by the Department of Parks and Recreation. This proposal is expected to produce roughly 3 million square feet of residential floor area or 3,000 new housing units, 250,000 square feet of retail space, and 90,000 square feet of community facility space, and 36,000 square feet of, of newly public, publicly accessible plaza space. As part of the Comprehensive Neighborhood Plan, the City of New York has committed to a series of investments to help revitalize the neighborhood. First, the City will make a significant investment to provide housing that is affordable to Rockaway residents. This plan, planning process, has ensured that 100 percent of new housing built on public land will be affordable, and the City intends to create 1,700 new units in the urban renewal area that will be 100 percent affordable, affordable, set aside for families earning as low as 30 percent AMI or below. Ensuring our most vulnerable populations will share in the new investments made in this community. The City has also committed to help preserve affordable housing by providing free legal services for Rockaway residents facing unlawful evictions and tenant harassment, expanding legal services and financial tools for low-income homeowners, and working with New York State to create a cease and desist zone to protect homeowners from unwanted solicitation. We will also, also through this process, we've also secured additional investment from the city that ensures that this important development plan is supported by essential infrastructure improvements that will benefit all Rockaway residents. We know that schools in the Rockaways are overcrowded and we have secured a commitment by the city to reserve a portion of the urban renewal area for the school construction authority to provide a new school as the neighborhood grows, add additional resources to meet the needs of daycare providers in the area, and to add $10 million in new funding that will be used to invest in our existing schools. 
on top of accelerating over $130 million in capital uh, and infrastructure investments for our schools as well, which will include playgrounds, libraries, auditoriums, and science labs. We know that attracting new residents to the area, area will also require needed improvements to the open space network in downtown Far Rockaway. To that end, we have a commitment by the city to turn an existing DSNY site in downtown Far Rockaway into a park. We've also secured an additional $59 million for much needed improvements to Bayswater Park and $9 million for upgrades to the Redfern Houses Playground. We wanted to ensure that a public housing residents who will see new parks come up in their neighborhood will also have their parks upgraded as well. That's, so uh, we're talking around nearly $78 million in park investments. The city has also committed over $77 million to install the required sewer infrastructure improvements, sidewalk expansions, public plazas, and other public amenities that improve the quality of life for all Rockaway residents. We also have a commitment by the city to pilot an expansion of the Rockaway Ferry Shuttle Service to downtown Far Rockaway to ensure all residents on the peninsula are able to benefit from new ferry service. And we also look forward to seeing the city's completion of the ferry, uh, an additional landing study uh, in the fall as well. The Department of Transportation has committed to conducting follow-up traffic studies and making the necessary improvements to the downtown Far Rockaway Street Network so that it can adequately handle new traffic that will be generated by incoming residents to the area. We also have a commitment by the S Department of Small Business Services to greatly expand its outreach and, outreach and programming to support local entrepreneurs and existing small businesses exploring options for creating a new business incubator space upgrades for our 101st Street po police precinct facilities, establishing a new community land trust in Edgemere, new funding for the Queens F Council for the Arts, renovating our downtown library, and a great deal of other needed investments for the Rockaway community. Finally, we have a commitment by the city to establish a local steering committee that will meet quarterly to monitor the progress of the development in downtown Far Rockaway, ensuring that the commitments made during this process will be realized for Rockaway residents. With these investments representing more than $126 million in new city funding, I'm confident that this plan will help kick off a new period of prosperity for downtown Far Rockaway. I'm ha happy to have worked with the administration to make this plan a reality, and we have so many people to thank. I want to thank EDC, HPD, DCP, and the mayor's office and all the other agencies involved for their work on this plan. I'd like to especially thank Mayor de Blasio, who kept his word, you know, when he said he was going to change the face of Far Rockaway and invest in our community. Uh, he's really kept that commitment. So I'm very grateful to the mayor for his commitment to the Rockaway community. To Deputy Mayor Alicia Glenn, who uh, toured Rockaway. I uh, was a newly minted council member and who came out and saw downtown Far Rockaway and really put her money where her mouth is. We're forever grateful to her. I'd also like to thank uh, President and CEO James Patchett of EDC, Eleni, Callie, Rebecca, Eric, and Nate Bliss from EDC. Commissioner Maria Torres Springer, Jordan Press in Paris, Estrada from HPD, Commissioner Marissa Lego, Daniel De Carabo, I'm going to mess up all your names. I never say their last names. And John Young, who I've known for like 15 years from the Queens DCP. John Paul Lupo, you may. Thank you. Sanam, thank you from the mayor's office. And of course, our council land use staff. Raju Mann, Dylan Casey, John Douglas, thank you, and Amy Levitin. And lastly, but certainly not least, my staff, my chief of staff, Mercedes Buchanan, Devaney Brown, who deserves a lot of kudos. Thank you, Devaney, for all the work you put in and all the hours, and Jordan Gibbons for his work as well. Um, so I want to thank everyone uh, for their work on this application. Okay, now and, and, and now we are going to go to a vote. All right, do any members of the subcommittee have any questions or statements on these applications? Statements are going to be after. Okay. All righty. Okay, I will now call a vote to approve land use items number 709, 711, and 729. 
Approve with modifications, land use items number 716, 718, 719, 720, and 721 through 726. And to disapprove land use item number 710, made in Puerto Rico, CAFE, and 717-462 Broadway 74-922 application. Council, please call the roll. Council Member Gentile. Congratulations, Council Member. I vote aye on all. Uh, Council Member Torres. Congratulations, aye on all. Chair Richards. Thank you. I vote aye. Council Member Williams. Uh, excuse me, I vote. Yes, sir. We may begin. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to vote aye on all. I want to congratulate the chair for the work he did on this. Still have some concerns about what's going to happen after we do this, because I know there's still some, some negotiations that have to go on, but it sounds like we did uh, pretty good on, on, the, on the deeper end. Uh, and again, this is uh, what I believe MIH uh, should have been from the beginning. Um, I'm glad that we're finally doing it now, particularly with some of the term sheets that have been brought to bear. Uh, but I think we missed a lot of opportunities by not uh, doing this type demanding this type uh, in MIH from the beginning. just want to make sure I put that on the record every time we deal with MIH. But uh, I want to say congratulations for the negotiations and I don't know. Thank you. All right, Council, oh, please call the roll. Sorry, I'm sharing with you. Uh, Council Member Reynoso. I just want to say congratulations to the chair. Uh, being a a, a secondary member of the Far Rockaway community. My wife is from Far Rockaway, um, and I I've, I've visit often. Um, I'm really excited to see about the, the renaissance of, of Far Rockaway and the work that you've done over the last couple of years, not including this rezoning, has been second to none. So congratulations, and I'm really excited to see the future of Far Rockaway grow. I vote aye on all. The land use items are approved in the number of five in the affirmative, zero negative, and zero abstentions, and referred to the full land use committee. Thank you. Any other statements? Oh, we're going to go to Councilmember Barron now for a statement on Ebenezer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to say that we want to thank all of the persons who came together to resolve all of the issues that we had about Ebenezer Plaza. They were issues of height, of density, of context, of shadow, and of parking. And each of those issues was addressed by the parties that were some very um, focused and intense and targeted and um, spirited meetings that we had, but we were able to come to that conclusion. And we're particularly pleased to see that this may be the type of project that will set an example for how we want to see minority-owned businesses, women-owned businesses significantly involved in the decision-making process because that's what we have here. So Brisa, as you may know, is uh, owned by a black woman who took the business after her father had established a business many years ago. And we've been working with Proceder as well to make sure that their operating agreement and the memorandum of understanding address all the issues. So with this project of Ebenezer Plaza, which is Ebenezer from the Bible, not from Charles Dickens' uh, story, <laughs> Okay, want to make that clear. So that this will be um, a partnership with community-based organizations for local hires. We're going to have retail space that's marketed to local community organizations. 20% of the construction and of the apartments will go for formerly homeless people. There will be a lottery which it gives a community preference to the community where it's located which is Community Board 16 as well as Community Board 5. And there will be ELLA term sheets so that families as low as 10% of AMI up to 27%. There'll be another band for 37% AMI as well as 47 and 57% AMI. So we're very pleased that the agreement also recognizes that in consideration of the fact that this building casts a shadow during part of the growing season on the Green Valley Farms that's located directly across the street that the developer will provide $10,000 a year for consideration of establishing the electrical units that need to be there and grow lights that will help to have the, pro the produce continue to thrive as well as a community benefits agreement that will give $15,000 annually to community-based organizations in uh, attempts to help 
their programs as well as offer scholarships. So that's just a highlight of some of what we were able to achieve. And once again, we're very thankful. We want to thank all the parties that participated in coming to this successful conclusion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. All righty, we're going to go to, all right. So these are applications. Uh, so we're going to go to 462 Broadway application land use items number 716 and 717. These are applications for two zoning special permits for an existing six-story building located at 462 Broadway in the Soho Cast Iron Historic District in Council Member Chen's District. The special per permit pursuant to Section 74781 Land use item number 716 would allow retail uses in the cellar and ground floor of the building. The applicant has agreed that no establishment will have more than 10,000 square feet of customer occupable uh, selling space, and the council will be modifying the plans to reflect this. The applicant has also agreed to operating conditions such as loading restrictions and trash storage, which will also be shown on the approved plans and which the applicant will include in its leases with retailers to ensure that the appropriately sized retailers resulting from this approval are good neighbors. Under these conditions, Councilmember Chen is able to support this application. However, the second special permit under Section 74922, land use item 717, would allow for large retail uses over 10,000 square feet. The applicant proposed to convert the ground floor through third floor to a single large retail establishment of approximately 28,634 zoning square feet exclusive of the seller. Councilmember Chen is unable to support this big box retail because retail at this scale is not appropriate for this location. The community has articulated legitimate quality of life concerns that cannot be adequately addressed. They include concerns about loading and the amount that would be necessarily given re giving retail of this size, lighting on multiple floors, the amount of trash, and the trend of pop-up events at establishments of this size. Councilmember Chen recommends disapproval of this special permit for this very reason. I'll go to Councilmember Chen for a statement. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you to the member of the subcommittee. Um, today, the subcommittee voted on two items related to a building located at 462 Broadway in the Soho neighborhood in my council district. The applicant originally sought two special permits, one to allow retail in excess of 10,000 square feet and another to permit, to permit retail use on the ground floor and cellar of the building following a good faith effort to market to manufacturing tenants. As proposed, Approval of these special permits would create an astronomical 45,000 square feet of retail space, and this I cannot support. This, I thank the committee for hearing the reservations of residents, member of community board two, and elected official, and deny the 74-922 large scale special permit. In regards to the use change permit, allowing ground for retail, after careful deliberation and public input, Community Board 2 insisted that this use permit be denied unless the applicant agree that no single store have in excess of 10,000 square feet. That includes cellar space that is usually not counted due to the definition in the zoning resolution has allowed large-scale retail to plague our community. In response to these concerns, the applicant agreed to modify the site plan that will be submitted to the Department of Buildings to include the following conditions. One, no single retail establishment at 462 Broadway will include more than 10,000 square feet of retail selling space. Two, no after-hour loading and unloading will take place on Crosby Street. Three, all trash will be stored on site, collected by a single commercial sanitation hauler during reasonable hours. Four, no illuminated sign will be permitted to be displayed in windows. Five, no temporary shops will be permitted to host events disturbing the peace and quiet of the neighborhood. Six, for permanent tenants, any special events will require customers to queue within the premises or tenants must seek a stable permit with public review. 
These site plans will be modified to reflect these conditions and DOB will be required to ensure that these conditions are met and will be able to enforce them during the issuing of certificate of occupancy or in the event of complaint that the building is in violation of these plans. Furthermore, the applicant has agreed to take all possible efforts to require that tenants follow the guidelines set forth by the Department of Transportation in order to curtail and mitigate noise from deliveries. The proposal being voted on today is vastly different than the massive seller to third floor retail submitted earlier this year. Through the hard work and determinations of our residents and community board, we have won an acknowledgement that large scale retail has no place in this iconic and historic neighborhood. Together, we have drawn a line that I hope will never be crossed again. Most importantly, this agreement will become a model to which every retail use application will have to conform in order to receive community board or city council approval. I, like the borough president, community board, and member of the Soho neighborhood, remain concerned about the increased number of good faith marketing and use change permit that are changing the character of Soho. I welcome a conversation with city planning and manufacturing advocates to determine how policy can be better reflects the needs of creative and non-traditional manufacturing firms in our city. Soho is a vibrant art-based community and maker space is crucial to the special character of this neighborhood. That being said, the applicant has agreed to significantly modify their proposal in order to meet reasonable community requirements and accommodate the use change permit. So though I urge the community, the subcommittee to deny the special large scale use permit, I recommend the approval of the use permit with all of these quality of life and good faith marketing condition attached. In countless meetings, hearings, emails, residents have made it clear that they need enforceable common sense protection to ensure that they do not become merely guests in a gigantic outdoor mall. With this agreement, we are beginning the process of ending the plague of large scale retail and taking back Soho so that it remains the special place that we know and love today. So thank you, thank you Chair. Thank you Council Member Shen. We're going to lay over for the future consideration all of the other applications that we did not vote on earlier. And with that being said, this meeting is now adjourned.